This was the most terrifying night of my life. It hasn't stopped replaying in my head. We were flabbergasted. There's, there's just no reason <laughs> for something like that to take place, especially here where everybody's family. We're angry, we're grieving, we're confused. People are hurting. It's the kind of thing that it, it makes you want to throw up or give up. It's too much to even process. The biggest problem that we have when we have a traumatic event is we want to try to get back to normal. And there is no normal again, ever. America is under fire. Welcome to our special report. I'm Kamasi Aaron. I'm Mike Sachs. Sadly and too often, we're telling you about yet another mass shooting. The most recent just this past weekend in rural Texas, another 26 innocent souls killed by a gunman. Just to put this into perspective, two of the deadliest shootings in modern American history have happened in the last six weeks, the five worst in the past 10 years. And because it's happening so often, we start to lose track and the facts get buried in arguments about gun control and who's to blame. We're not here to change your mind or to scare you, but to get you real solid answers about what's happening in America. So today we're gonna talk about things that you can do and what's being done to protect you. Let's start with the facts. Our partners at PolitiFacts help me research where we really stand when it comes to mass shootings in America. The first thing we ask PolitiFact, what is a mass shooting? The answer, it all depends on who you ask because there is no universally accepted definition. The nonprofit group Gun Violence Archive defines a mass shooting as at least four or more people killed or injured. Congress says it's three or more killed in a single incident. And the FBI and Congressional Research Services is narrower still. Four or more victims are murdered within one event. That means there could be as few as 10 mass shootings in America so far this year, or as many as 308. Our partners at PolitiFact say however mass shootings are defined, America still leads the world. It's clear that the United States has a disproportionate number of, of these mass shootings, not, um, and it's sort of beyond a question of our population being bigger. What about the weapon of choice? PolitiFact found semi-automatic rifles similar to the AR-15 have been used in five of the top 10 mass shootings in the U.S. and the three most recent ones. There are between 6 and 10 million of those rifles in the U.S. right now. So is every mass shooting in the U.S. an act of domestic terrorism? PolitiFact found not necessarily. By law, there must be intent to intimidate the public or to intimidate the government into changing policies or how it operates. No matter the why behind these mass shootings, it's the where that hits home with all of us. Mass shootings are touching all of our safe spaces, where we go to school, where we worship, where we see movies, where we work, and where we listen to music. To avoid these places is to avoid life, and that's just not an option. And that's why the people who design the places we go are thinking about that for us. It is the tragedy that we all remember. 20 children and six adults killed at Sandy Hook Elementary School. Next month will mark five years. Today, there are new memories. The building is new, and so is the security inside and out. We're seeing the front of a school. Architect Julia McFadden designed safer schools like this, where anyone entering is visible long before they ever walk in the door. We can see out these windows and through this glass and see you approaching. And that's a good, strong psychological message. At Sandy Hook, the windows of the school are also planned. They give a view of nature outside, but provide a hiding place in an emergency away from a bad guy's view. If they're looking into the classroom, they can't see what's below the windowsill. So it, it creates a zone in which, if need be, people can hide and, and duck down. People are funneled to one of three entrance bridges that lead over wetlands. The moat concept is actually very uh, real in the sense that it is a water body. William Richter says a determined person could make it, but they would sure seem out of place, hopefully giving school administrators and teachers a chance to realize that something is wrong. That's the goal here, to prevent unauthorized people from having access and slow everyone down who's coming into the school. Even the parking lot is a distance away. Classrooms are behind administration offices at the back of the building. So that if someone is trying to approach a school, there's other layers to get through to get to the students in the classrooms. Schools like the one here in Sandy Hook are not the only places to have these new security measures. In fact, they're being introduced in commercial buildings all over the country. So office buildings, they always talk about security. Uh, clinics nowadays, too, you have to worry about that. 
Architect Jay Brotman says with today's technology, an alarm in a building can be sounded that triggers more security. The alarm goes off, the door closes, the lock goes, the deadbolt throws. All of this technology can be wrapped in a building that gives a safe feeling without being secluded from the outside world. You don't have to have a building look like a fortress to have good security. Correct. You really do not. The cost of such a building does not come with a high price tag because it's more about the smart layout of the items you're already paying for anyway. Here in the U.S., we like to think we're the best at everything. So why can't we stop these shootings? We've traveled to another country where they are rare and found out what they're doing differently. It's clear that we have mass shooting after mass shooting after mass shooting. It's so staggering that you don't even remember the number. You don't even remember all the names. There is a battle going on in America. Nobody seems to agree on a solution when it comes to gun control. But one thing's for sure. We have a lot of guns in this country. When it comes to guns, the U.S. stands out from the pack in a big way. Namely, it has way more guns than any other nation in the world. The only other developed nations with a lot of guns keep tight controls over ammunition. To give you an idea of just how many guns are floating around this nation with the most mass shootings, take a look at this. Americans own almost half of all civilian-owned guns in the world. And yet, with all those guns, the U.S. has some of the loosest restrictions on firearms of any developed nation. In the past few months, the only notable action in the U.S. Congress on gun laws has been an effort backed by the National Rifle Association to lift restrictions on gun silencers. An in-depth study released last year shows just how many more mass shootings the U.S. has than any other nation. In fact, the U.S. only has about 5% of the world's population, but 31% of the world's mass shootings happen in the U.S. No matter what side of gun control you land on, there's clearly a problem. But there are countries that are doing it right, and one of them is just north of the border. I'm Ross Jones in Windsor, Ontario, where we came across the border to talk to Canadians about just why our rate of gun violence is seven times higher than theirs. Two countries that could not be closer couldn't be further apart when it comes to guns. Majority of the people do not need or feel the need to have a gun because we're quite safe up here. In Canada, they talk about guns differently because they look at guns differently. You have the Second Amendment and we don't. I would think that most Canadians are squeamish around firearms and, and don't want any part of it. Across the river from Windsor in Detroit, there were 302 homicides last year, most of them involving a firearm. In Windsor, during the same time period, there were three. Al Frederick is Windsor's chief of police. The difference, I think, in my view, is the accessibility to firearms. We don't have a culture of people that, you know, are eager to carry or seek out to carry a firearm. In Canada, unlike the U.S., it's a crime for the average citizen to even walk around with a gun. But that's far from the only thing separating these two countries. A first-time gun buyer in the United States can walk into a store and leave with a gun the same day. In Canada, it takes weeks, maybe months. The U.S. still allows for gun purchases without a background check. Not here in Canada. They're mandatory for any gun license. Your file is given to uh, an officer, and it's their job to go through it and prove that you are able to have a license. And while there's often a push to expand gun rights in the U.S., in Canada, there are few here leading that fight. As one Canadian told me this week, guns are a right where you live. They're a privilege where we live. I don't think there's a nation on earth where they've armed their citizenry, which has reduced violence. It's interesting to hear what's working in other parts of the world, but there is something that works here. Mass shootings are prevented, you just never hear about it. What we're gonna share with you after the break will not only surprise, but empower you. Now let's talk about the killers. We're not going to use their names. We're not even going to show you their full faces. But it's important to better understand what drives them to do the unthinkable. Patrick Terpstra is getting answers about what goes through their minds. What do the mass shooters tend to have in common? 
Dr. Richard Cooter is a forensic psychologist at George Washington University. He specializes in mass shootings and the mind of a killer. You'll have some people who are true psychopaths. That's relatively rare. The, the majority of these folks, they have a grievance of some sort. It may be real, it may be imagined, but whatever it is, it's real to them. An FBI report looked at 160 active shootings and found gunmen almost always acted alone, were usually male, and a wide range of ages, and killed themselves about 40 percent of the time. But just what makes a person want to carry out such a horrific crime in the first place? Dr. Cooter says something makes them lose empathy and disconnect from their conscience. Oftentimes, he says, they become overwhelmingly angry. They tend to isolate from people and they just ruminate over this grievance. And over a period of time, they will come to the point that that they can't stand it anymore. The Sandy Hook shooter was apparently mad at his mother. The Pulse nightclub shooter, who pledged allegiance to ISIS, was said to be angry at the world. Cooter says they may let the anger simmer, building until it makes them direct their rage at society. Other shooters are what he would consider highly psychotic, unable to feel remorse. He points to the shooter who opened fire in a movie theater in Aurora, Colorado. Came for a shooting at Century Theaters. Doctors testified he had a psychotic mental illness. The gunman who targeted Arizona Congresswoman Gabby Giffords and others was diagnosed with schizophrenia. And there's another factor. For the deeply disturbed, a mass shooting can offer instant fame, a way to make their life seem to have meaning. They become famous for a while. Uh, they're usually not around to know it, but that's the plan. And with that, it is a race to find the next mass shooter. There's one key thing all of us can do to make a difference. Speak up. We found it's working better than any of us may realize, but it's sadly a challenge that will never go away. You hear about mass shootings happening around the nation, but what you rarely hear about are the ones that didn't happen, that were prevented. About two years ago, this Colorado high school was the location for a potential mass shooting. You know, there are more interventions than there are mass shootings. Kevin Klein, the director of the Colorado Division of Homeland Security, says in just the last year, the FBI has prevented 150 mass shootings across the country because of threat assessment and prevention. That doesn't include what happens on a day-to-day -day basis in local law enforcement. That doesn't include what happens in the mental health uh, provider community. Uh, or social services. The reason, he says, is because people who carry out or plan to carry out attacks usually tip us off. Homeland Security reports that in 81% of mass shooting cases, the offenders told somebody about their plans. In 59% of the cases, the shooter told more than one person. It's not that people snapped, they decided. And when you look at what went on beforehand, there was preparation. And alerting authorities when you hear something is the key. Just eight miles away from here is a school America knows all too well, Columbine High School. After the shooting took place there, local law enforcement decided to create a program called Text a Tip. That program is the same program that prevented this school from having a mass shooting. So the public is what we rely on to help us prevent these bad things from happening. If you have a concern, Say something. Dr. Russell Polaria is the president of the Association of Threat Assessment Professionals. He agrees with Klein that tips from the public are essential to preventing deadly attacks. Once we determine if there is, in fact, a concern for violence risk, we design management strategies to try to help that person solve their problems. The program includes counseling, taking part in community service, having friends and family do weekly check-ins, and working with a school tutor weekly. But even when their strategy succeeds, the process is still a challenge. But it's an ongoing and continuous process. It's not a one one shot deal. We need to continually work with these folks to find pro-social ways to manage their stress and resolve their problems. Otherwise, some folks will revert back to their violent tendencies and ultimately commit attacks. Thanks, Annie. There's one group we haven't talked about yet the victims. Our hearts break for their families and we often feel helpless like there's nothing we can really do for them. But when we come back, we talk to a Columbine survivor who told us there is. For the average American citizen, they have to sit down and think, what am I willing to accept in my society? And what am I willing to not accept in my society? And for me personally, I'm not willing to accept the fact that we are just going to allow these episodes of mass violence to continue to snowball out of control. And then there was just random people stopping and helping people and picking people up off the ground. He said, I've got you. 
and it's just truly incredible. A uh, stranger, you know, jumping over me to protect me. There are a lot of people who survived these shootings thanks to people they'd never met. We talked with this woman. She wants to be ready if she becomes that total stranger. And we just need to be prepared anywhere that we are to save somebody's life if we can. And if somebody can take two hours out of a day and come learn how to save a life, it's worth it. Sadly, as much as we'd like and as hard as we try, not everyone can be saved. These are just some of the mothers and fathers, children and friends who've been killed. Memorials are built in cities all across the country to honor them, but is that really enough? Could we be doing more? We spent some time with a man who can answer that question for all of us. Austin Eubanks is a survivor from Columbine. He lost his best friend. He told our Chris Welch there is something all of us can do for the victims and their families. Do you think that we as a society do enough to remember the people we lost in mass shootings? I don't think so. Um, I think that if we had done enough to remember the people who we had lost in mass shootings, that we would have been at a point where they weren't continuing to occur at an ever greater rate. These days, Austin Eubanks prefers not to talk about what happened on April 20th, 1999. That's when he and his best friend, Corey DePooter, huddled underneath a table in the library of their high school, while two of their classmates went on a rampage. He was shot twice, Corey was one of the 13 victims killed. Many say he was the kind of guy people like to be around. I know I sure did. I love you, Corey, and you'll be by my side forever. For Eubanks, that was the beginning of a downward spiral toward addiction. First into prescription medications for his physical pain, but that, he says, led to illicit drugs and alcohol. So I held on to that belief that because this tragic, uh, this profound tragedy happened to me, that I needed those medications to be functional. And I maintained that false core belief for uh, the better part of a decade until I finally found long-term recovery. Not only did he find recovery, he's made it his life's work here in the mountains of Steamboat Springs, Colorado, where he's the COO of Foundry Treatment Center. Do you think you'd be doing what you're doing today were you not in that library in 1999? There's no way. He sees a direct correlation between the rise in mass shootings and the ever-worsening opioid crisis. And, and I see this happen time and time again where uh, these events occur and um, addiction ripples through a, a community as a symptom of the trauma from one of these events. Three of the five deadliest shootings have taken place in just the last year and a half. I never thought that it would get to this point. Eubanks says that makes it particularly hard to remember and honor the lives lost. Because it's literally hundreds and hundreds of people now who have died as a victim of a mass shooting in the United States. So how can we remember them? Well, for me personally, the way that I remember my best friend is by doing the work that I do today. And he says there's something we can all do right now. The common thread through all of these perpetrators isn't some radical worldview uh, or uh, religious motivation or motivation by targeting a specific demographic. The common denominator through all of these people is isolation and loneliness. Eubanks says we can all work on that by simply reaching out to more people in our communities, even if they seem different, and teaching our children to do the same. Whether you knew someone who was killed or injured or not, this is something that anyone can work on in the U.S. Absolutely, very much so. And I think that it's something that everyone needs to work on in the U.S. Despite the fact that things have only gotten worse since Columbine, Eubanks says he's confident the problem will get better. He says it has to. What a powerful message. It really is. And Chris, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. As we know, mass shootings don't discriminate. The victims come from every race, religion, age, and gender. We may disagree on how to end these unthinkable crimes, but what we do agree on is that it must stop. Hopefully you feel more empowered so that you can be a part of the solution. Look for warning signs, put up the red flag, get involved in your communities, and be willing to listen to other viewpoints. Thanks for joining us.